matches with Eindhoven, University of Technology. with Eindhoven University of Technology and with the MIT. Uh, now you have his 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 detailed resume. I, I knew Jan at least what almost 20 more 20 plus years ago. I mean we we've met in 1980 was what 87, 87 right? No, no, no. Maybe no, early 90s? 1991. 1991. Yeah, yeah. This was in Washington, D.C. I was working yes. at the Bender, Bender Consulting. You came and you visited us. Then we collaborated when you at Man Logistics. I was always impressed with Eindhoven, with the Dutch way of looking at logistics. Now, Jan is, is a classical operations management guy. He started hardcore scheduling in chemical manufacturing. Then, like the rest of us, when you get a little bit older, you start getting more into what is what has more social impact? Uh, how do I serve uh, people at the base of the pyramid? Uh, uh, logistics, uh, last mile issues. So without much ado, I want to pass it to Jan. The way we're going to do it, we're going to allow Jan to talk first for 20, 25 minutes. And then uh, I'll have a few comments and then we'll open the floor for general discussions. Thank you, sir. Jan, floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. Let me share my slide. Okay, so here I am. Does it look okay? Good. Love. Thank you. So yeah, thanks, uh, Ali. It's uh, always great to, to see you and uh, to have this opportunity to share some of my work and also uh, share some of the excitement that uh, I have uh, around uh, uh, retail in emerging markets. As, as Ali has been uh, saying, uh, I, I have a sort of a, a, a long history of, of different types of work, but uh, um, I work a lot in the chemical industry, uh, uh, retail, ocean shipping. Last few years, I've been working mainly in the area of sustainability, uh, human behavior, uh, some work around ocean transport logistics, which I think could be also quite relevant given the situation Egypt is in right now. Uh, but but I'll talk today about uh, work that I started uh, now about 12 years ago, and which was captured in a, in a book we published in 2017, which is called uh, Reaching 50 Million Nanostores, where essentially I'm interested in the millions of usually family mom and pop operated grocery stores uh, that serve uh, consumers uh, in the lower middle class and base of the pyramid in many developing countries. I think we estimate there's about 4 billion consumers that essentially uh, buy their daily uh, groceries not in formalized supermarkets uh, or other types of large formalized channels, but through informal neighborhood stores. And I got really fascinated uh, through this. And this, this, uh, I, I started with this 2012, primarily first working in Latin America. And uh, one of the things that, that struck me is that a lot of the big retailers coming out of North America and Europe uh, were trying to enter uh, into this market, uh, but were actually struggling to compete, uh, to compete with, with, with the small stores, with the service that uh, they provide, with the facilities that they provide in the neighborhood. Think of the informal credit that's being provided. Um, ta the tailored assortments, the flexibility in opening, doing occasional home delivery, etc. And it seemed more and more it's very, very difficult for uh, large uh, organized retailers to effectively uh, compete with this channel. And then moreover, I would say particularly in the last five or six years, we see that in addition, uh, there is a very rapid uh, digitization happening. Uh, where uh, both uh, suppliers, but also lots of startups. And uh, I think in, in Egypt, uh, Maxap is, uh, is, is a very big uh, company that has been trying 
to uh, sort of uh, cause a digital revolution also in this market. Now, now, what we do in our research is that we try to understand why uh, this channel is operating as it is, how uh, we can increase, uh, the, in particular, the logistics and operations efficiency, and also in how uh, the introduction of these technologies can benefit the shopkeepers and the consumers uh, in this uh, in this channel, right? So um, um, if, if you think, like I mentioned, we think there's about 50 million of these stores. They serve about 4 million consumers. Uh, market shares uh, vary a bit in the countries where they operate. Uh, I actually checked the market share uh, last week for Egypt. In Egypt, it's about 75% in the consumer goods for consumer packaged goods that essentially goes through this uh, traditional channel and uh, rapid digitization taking place primarily enabled through the fact that uh, smartphones have become widely accessible at a relatively uh, low cost. Now, my perspective on this channel, I, I call this channel, I use the word nanostores, um, uh, mainly because uh, in every country, there's a particular word that actually denotes this, that, that is very much ingrained in the local dialect and the local language. Uh, even in Latin America, where we've done a lot of our work, the common language is Spanish, but even the Spanish word used in different uh, languages, different countries for these nanostores is different. I don't know what it is in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, uh, but I'm sure you also have your local word to somehow uh, denote these uh, these stores around the corner. Collectively, this uh, channel is the largest retail channel in the world, which implies that for so consumer uh, packaged goods producers, if you think of companies, international companies like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, uh, this is uh, the biggest channel that uh, they are serving in terms of the number of consumers. Uh, in many of these countries, uh, bottom of the pyramid consumers, they actually move from the countryside into urban areas. They grow their income. And actually, uh, typically the first thing they start spending more of their additional income on is on consumer packaged goods, which means for these uh, uh, CPG companies, uh, actually, uh, this is also the channel where they still see growth. Um, there is a competition with other retail channels entering in, into this market. Uh, I think large supermarkets have tried this. There, I, I see them gradually withdrawing from, from these markets, but uh, a lot of convenience uh, channels are now doing this. And I actually, I was last month in Morocco and there was is a new, at least over there, it was new Egyptian convenience store chain. Uh, which has been growing uh, rapidly in North Africa, as I understand. And we try to understand how this particular channel also uh, competes uh, with the traditional channel of uh, nano stores. And one of the reasons why they can compete is also because suppliers, uh, the consumer goods manufacturing, uh, the Danones, the Unilevers of this world, local brands, they strategically support this channel because they make a higher margin. And then finally, uh, traditionally, you would say if you're in operations as well, I need to create economies of scale and economies of scale, uh, they will uh, in the end lead to reduction of cost. But I believe that the digitization by itself may create economies of scale without necessarily physically integrating these stores. And I think that that's really fascinating. Now, if, if you look at these stores, the, uh, many of these stores, they have uh, quite a close relationship with the manufacturers that supply them. And this relationship uh, goes uh, across the entire domain of demand generation, uh, manufacturers, representatives, sales agents, they may visit the stores to actually stimulate sales uh, to help shopkeepers position the products. They process orders, uh, they conduct physical distribution very often directly, um, particularly large and strong brands. They tend to do this directly. Um, uh, payment collection uh, and also after sales service in helping the stores uh, organize their stores. So all these functions 
uh, are there. And that implies if we think of operational excellence and the actual operations happening in the channel, this could have actually happen in all of these different dimensions. Um, today, I'll focus uh, in particular on aspects uh, related to, to physical distribution and payment collection. And I'll just give, I'll, I'll give two examples of uh, studies that we have been conducting. There's a whole series of studies across many different countries we have been conducting. I'll give an overview at the end, but I'll give you two examples as a, um, as a kind of a teaser of the type of work that we are doing, uh, oftentimes partnering with suppliers or with technology providers. Now, if, if you think of uh, operations excellence and the perspective of the supplier, this is sort of the, the, the if you like, the happy flow that uh, a supplier, uh, think of, uh, could, be, could be a Coca-Cola or so, that serves this channel, or uh, Danone, I know is also very active in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, I'm sure you also have very strong local brands that, that serve this channel. Um, so essentially in this channel, you see that uh, uh, suppliers typically have a sales agent that visits the store. Um, then an order is being placed. Uh, this is the traditional flow, right? Sort of before digitization. Uh, and then the next day delivery takes place via delivery van. Uh, the delivery takes place to the store. And then um, uh, the store uh, receives the goods and takes care of the payment. Now, what is important for a supplier is uh, what they try to do is they try to get a larger share of the wallet of the shopkeeper uh, on the one end. So that means of the limited uh, cash and also space for that matter, right? That the shopkeeper has to spare. Uh, this supplier would like to get a larger share. So that implies a supplier does not just compete uh, with other suppliers that are in the same category, but effectively competes with all other suppliers that supply to this store in getting a larger share of the wallet. And secondly, the supplier would like to help the shopkeeper increase its overall wallet size, because if the shopkeeper gets bigger, uh, gets a larger wallet, uh, there's an opportunity for the supplier to essentially sell more to this particular store. Now, if I look at the reverse, uh, at the perspective of the shopkeeper, this is actually a bit different and it sort of helps you understand how these shopkeepers are operating. So, first of all, when this sales agent comes, this shopkeeper needs to think ahead, essentially, typically a day ahead, 24 hours, is when the delivery takes place, do I actually have the cash to be able to make the payment? This requires a projection and actually, a uh, projection of the cash flow as it will emerge over the next 24 hours because the shopkeeper places the order here and gets a delivery here. The shopkeeper needs to be able to pay. And one of the challenges actually in this channel is that typically deliveries get lost because at the moment of delivery, the shopkeeper may not be able uh, to pay for, uh, for this. Then uh, the, 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 the shopkeeper in the meantime, so between placing the order and receiving the cash also has the consumers uh, visiting the store. So these consumers, they will generate uh, additional cash for the shopkeeper that somehow needs to be taken into account in this projection that the shopkeeper needs to make in terms of planning uh, his cash flow. Uh, you notice that I stress a lot the cash flow. So I, I look at these shopkeepers as in fact managing their cash flow. So they have a limited cash flow, which they try to spread across these different suppliers that are visiting them, because uh, it is not just one supplier, but there are multiple suppliers that are actually visiting this store at particular moments in time. So if you look at this, actually the, 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 the management and the, and the decisions that these shopkeepers are facing are actually quite complex. This is not a trivial thing to operate a store like this. And this, I think this is also very often underestimated, but I believe these shopkeepers, they're smart. They're smart in running, running their business, managing their cash, also oftentimes giving out informal credit to, uh, to consumers. So managing this entire operation. And, and they do this in a very challenging environment. So the challenging environment means there's limited space, 
the neighborhoods, uh, they may sometimes not be very safe where they are operating. Um, and uh, they also uh, may not have uh, always uh, the right facilities to store the products. And, and uh, the environment is also challenging in terms of its actual the logistics and, and deliveries, right? So, so this is just a, actually a, a relatively residential neighborhood in Mexico City, where you see over here, there's this particular corner store uh, here. And you see already for this store at this point in time, uh, there are four uh, delivery uh, trucks parked um, doing uh, deliveries to, uh, to this store just at a random moment in time. So uh, this already shows that the logistics and the operation of this logistics is quite uh, challenging because this results in waiting times, it results in coordination problems uh, around uh, this store. Um, now, today I'll focus on, on two things. One is around the uh, FinTech solutions, uh, payment digitization or with order-based trade credit, and the other one is on digital services in the, in the store. And uh, as I said, I'm happy to take uh, any further questions during the discussion. Now, what we see in these uh, FinTech solutions is that uh, there are two types of solutions that I think are uh, currently being made possible through digitization. One is the digitization of the payment itself, uh, which uh, allows uh, for less handling of physical cash, uh, saving operational time, uh, but also maybe decoupling uh, the moment of delivery from the moment of payment. And that then also enables uh, to uh, instate uh, short-term credit, which I name here as order-based trade credit. Now in payment digitization, here again, this is sort of the happy flow that I said earlier, uh, but what uh, many people may not realize is that there is also a reverse flow because once the cash, the physical cash, is being collected, it implies this cash needs to be transported back into the supply chain, uh, back to the distribution center where it needs to be reconsolidated, counted again, uh, leading by the way to, to lots of manual labor in terms of counting all of the cash, um, and then being transported using secure transport down to a bank. And maybe only four or five days after the cash is being received, it appears in the bank account of the supplier. So th this also lengthens uh, the order to cash uh, cycle for these uh, suppliers. That doesn't make it very attractive. Now where digital payment has been growing, so this is in India with Paytm, in Peru with Yappe, uh, in, uh, in China with uh, Ali, Alipay, is essentially that at this point, there is immediately a digital payment. And at that point, immediately uh, the cash appears in the bank account of uh, the supplier. So that delay is no longer there. There's also no risk in carrying the cash. And also the, the physical costs associated with handling the cash, which we, uh, based on our studies, we did time and motion studies around this, we estimate this to be about one third of the time of the stop. Just getting the cash, getting the change. Uh, this, this is a savings that being made in the operations, which will effectively reduce the cost of operation and hence uh, part of that uh, will uh, sift through to the cost of the consumer. Second way is that this can also be used uh, to extend uh, credit to the stores. And uh, uh, one way in which uh, one a supplier uh, that we have been working with in Peru is doing this, is that essentially they postpone payment, one ordering cycle, which typically is a week later, uh, where the payment uh, is being made to the, the sales agent. Could actually also be in uh, in cash or, or digital. Now, the, the question uh, that uh, we were trying to address with this particular company is, well, what are the benefits of extending this cash, uh, this credit, right? So I give a one week credit uh, to this, uh, uh, these, these stores. And with this credit, there is a risk associated, right? Because uh, the stores may not pay back the credit. There's a relatively high turnover in these stores in uh, in Latin America. Uh, so so the, the shopkeepers may, may default on this. 
So uh, suppliers are generally quite reluctant in extending the credit. Now, we, we analyzed with this distributor uh, a large data set consisting of about 550,000 uh, orders. This uh, supplier, you see here a picture of the distribution. They were uh, uh, selling and, and supplying uh, paper products. Uh, think of Kimberly Clark type of uh, products. Uh, uh, toilet paper, uh, household paper, kitchen paper, these type of things. Um, so we have three years worth of data, uh, 20,000 stores being served by this particular uh, distributor. And over this period of time, at any moment in time, 6,000 of those stores uh, received the credit. And what we were estimating is trying to say, well, if a store took up such a credit, was there actually an increase in the subsequent sales? Because the idea is, well, these stores are somehow cash constrained. So uh, if they have a credit, they essentially have a little bit more cash that they have. And uh, they could use this cash to buy additional products, in which case the inventory in the store would be a little bit higher and they could uh, supply at uh, higher service levels to the consumer and overall sell more. Well, it turns out actually there is a huge effect. So just one week of credit more than doubles the sales. So this really shows that these stores are massively cash constrained and even a tiny bit of credit really uh, helps a lot. Um, we, we also uh, show, oh, this is the econometrics uh, specification. We also look a bit more in detail into what is driving this. And here you see the different components. So, the, so a main effect is that there is a larger conversion rate. So this implies uh, if, the sales agent visits and the shopkeeper has been given credit, it is more likely that they will actually place an order. Uh, if they place an order, the auction order is actually larger. And uh, for all of the orders that they place, they also have a larger number of categories and a larger number of, uh, of SKUs of different products, which is particularly what commercial teams would like because it means also product variety is increasing and this generally uh, is believed to, to, to actually increase uh, sales, right? Now, if, if this uh, sales increase is there, you can then take this back and do a trade-off with the uh, additional uh, risk that the shopkeepers face in terms of default. And uh, you see over here a little curve, which we computed through simulation, where we say, well, suppose there's a cost of financing of, uh, of 4%, there's a gross margin of 25% that the supplier may, uh, may have. You essentially see that uh, the weekly, notice is the weekly default probability, right? So uh, can be very, very high. So this would imply one in seven stores would go, would would just default every week, and then I'm just still breaking even. So, so this is really a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that suppliers should extend this credit. This is uh, without charging a, an interest rate to the shopkeeper, which we actually advocate. We say the benefits are so big, there should not be any, any uh, uh, hurdles for the shopkeeper to make them adopt this. But you could say, well, I charge a bit more, this shifts the curve a bit, but as you see, there's not a major uh, major difference. If you're interested in this, uh, take a, a, a now a, a QR code scan, and this is the full paper where we outline uh, all of the details. Um, I realize I'm running already a little bit late, but I have one more example, right? And this is around digitization. So, so in general, we see there is uh, an increasing interest to digitize uh, nanostore operations. And this uh, could happen with uh, companies in the startup scene or scale-up scene. Tenda Pago is a company in Mexico that uh, provides uh, trade credits. Uh, Wasoko is actually the company that just merged with, uh, with MaxApp. Uh, they dig they uh, um, uh, digitized the ordering process uh, of uh, shopkeepers. Um, a government sometimes help out. There's a very big program in uh, China that helps in particular these nanostores in uh, rural areas. 
uh, tech companies like Alibaba or Amazon, uh, they have discovered this channel um, either through providing uh, services like uh, Alibaba, they provide a B2B delivery service uh, for inventory replenishment. Uh, and Amazon, uh, they uh, have a big program that started in India that's currently, I think, in about 30 countries where uh, uh, e-commerce deliveries for the last mile, they go through the nano stores rather than uh, delivering them to the consumer, which brings uh, additional revenue and traffic to the stores. And then there are consumer uh, goods, uh, packaged goods manufacturers like ABMBF. They develop their own uh, B2B uh, platform. Uh, and Arca Continental, which is one of the largest bottlers for Coca-Cola, they uh, provide a, a point of sales uh, system. So there are many of these examples uh, around. And uh, this uh, is supported in many cases by manufacturers. They support these stores strategically because in that way they can better control the transactional terms. Uh, they can uh, guarantee a larger presence of products in the market and they can grow consumption at the base of the pyramid. Now, we've been working with uh, one of these manufacturers, uh, actually none of the ones we mentioned, but uh, I cannot disclose the name of the manufacturer. But they uh, uh, had, this was actually a manufacturer of, of consumer packaged uh, goods, so food-related uh, items. And they uh, uh, provided a system to the stores that enable these stores to get additional digital business. And these incurred uh, services like phone and data top-ups. So the store could make additional money by selling uh, data credit. Uh, by enabling the store to take card payments, uh, which allows them to also uh, provide more services to middle-class consumers uh, who, who may have access to, uh, to card payments. And then the payment of services, where uh, in particular in many countries, many developing countries, the payment of utilities goes through uh, through through to government offices or or offices of the utility companies, um, and very often consumers pay these uh, utilities in in cash, or or in, uh, and uh, this system allows these nano stores to actually take these uh, payments in the nano store uh, directly to uh, to then pay the utilities. Um, now, uh, in addition, the manufacturer supports the use of the system by opening a bank account for the shopkeepers. So many many of these shopkeepers are, are unbanked. This is in uh, Latin America, by the way, this operation. And then they offer a cash collection service to convert uh, any of the cash into float that they uh, may have uh, in the system. So if a consumer pays in cash uh, for the data top up, this, this leaves the shopkeeper with cash and the manufacturer offers a service to actually collect this cash and convert this into float so that they can sell additional data top ups. Uh, now, what, what we did here is, again, an empirical analysis. So uh, we had essentially uh, data of uh, the sales uh, that these uh, this particular consumer goods manufacturer had of their products to the nano stores. Uh, so these were their original sales. So think of food items. Actually, this was in the bakery category. And then we had all of the transaction data on these digital services, right? And what we were interested in, out of these digital services, the shopkeeper uh, generates additional income. Do they actually use this to have their store develop and buy more products, more bakery products at this uh, supplier, such that uh, overall uh, value increases, right? We also had the, the store location data. So that allows us also to see if there were any uh, cannibalization effects of, uh, of neighboring stores. Data for, for three years. Yeah, so um, uh, what, what we have is that, so, so think of this as a particular part of a city. Um, and in a city, uh, there are thousands of uh, stores. 
And some of these stores, they have adopted this system. And we essentially uh, look at this store and look at what's happening, how this store is doing relative to the neighboring stores. Yeah. Um, uh, interestingly, we also had a number of uh, organized convenience stores in the sample. So it also allows us uh, to do some comparison with these convenience stores, uh, which typically already offer these services. Um, now, what we find is that uh, these stores that offer these digital services, they actually use a considerable part of this uh, to increase uh, their uh, buy-in of traditional products. And we see here, there is an increase of 17%. Uh, so think of this as an increase of 70% in the business, right? This is quite substantial in growing, uh, growing their business. Uh, and uh, this uh, relates um, uh, to more sales. Uh, these are perishable products, so there's also some more uh, returns, but also uh, these are, uh, they buy products at a higher price. So that means also more luxury products as part of their assortment. So that means the stores are really upgrading as a consequence of being able to, uh, to have these digital services and also have a larger assortment. And uh, we can also see uh, that this effect is persistent over time. So imagine this graph as uh, over here in the middle. Uh, uh, this is the, the treatment. So when the digital service was introduced, this is uh, the normalized uh, sales uh, prior, to, uh, the, uh, prior to the introduction of the digital service. And then you see over here actually an increasing, an increasing uh, effect size, which implies that over time this shop really becomes more uh, economically wealthy. They they become better off. Their business becomes better. So digitization and adding these digital services really helps in making these shops uh, more competitive. So these are uh, just uh, two examples. Uh, as you see here, this is a quick overview. Uh, we, we, we've done uh, optimization type of work, uh, empirical estimations, work in the lab, uh, field experiments on a variety of different topics. These are the studies actually uh, that we already uh, completed, uh, either, either published or are available uh, online. These are the studies we are currently conducting uh, or being uh, or, or, or about to be finished. We started a lot of our work in uh, in Latin America, uh, but we have been moving into Africa. We currently have uh, two uh, projects. Uh, well, one project completed in, in Morocco, another project running in Morocco, and a project running in uh, Kenya. If uh, any of you are, uh, are in this business, uh, either as a consumer goods manufacturer or as a startup, uh, we are more than interested uh, to get in uh, touch. And I'm very curious also to learn more about, uh, about the Egyptian environment. Sorry for running five minutes uh, over time, uh, Ali, but I hope it was engaging. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, now, you said that they have higher margins, right? Yeah. The buyers. So does that mean that they actually, uh, the, the, the nano stores would offer the same product at a higher price? Um, so I, I think there, there are multiple effects uh, at play here. So um, one is uh, generally in the nano store, the product per unit, uh, per let's call this per kilogram or per unit, will be more expensive than in a supermarket. Yes. And that is because they're sold in smaller quantities. Uh, so that, that is an effect, right? No, I'm saying the same thing. The same thing, the same size, same everything. If it's same size, uh, generally the price differences are barely there. That's not what we're seeing. But in yeah. many cases, the very small size packages, uh, suppliers will choose to only supply this to the nanostore channel strategically. Okay. Because this is what okay. these consumers are doing. Yes. Um, I think is also further driving why these manufacturers are making more money. It's an, an issue of negotiating power, right? So uh, in the organized channel, 
actually mo a very big part of the margin ends up at the retailer. So at the Carrefour or the Tesco or the Walmart or whoever is there, they are actually the powerful player in the channel and they eat up the margin. In this channel, more of the margin stays with the supplier, um, but this also encourages them to strategically invest in this Nanosaur channel to make sure okay. this channel, yeah, they can thrive, yeah. Part of the investment today, I see for Egypt, for example, especially CPG consumers, they either have smaller packs, yeah, all together a different product that are cheaper or more value, value, value. Uh... Yeah, could be. <laughs> so, so I, I, I think so. I don't know the Egypt situation, right? But in many countries, what we see is that, let's say, for the international brands. They may offer smaller packages. So yes. for instance, I saw in Morocco, I saw rather than a 33 milliliter Coke can, I saw a 20 milliliter can. Yes. Uh, the, these type of uh, adjustments to make the price point also more accessible uh, for consumers at, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid. In India, there are more extreme cases where, for instance, you also get a single serve uh, laundry uh packs i don't know if they are also in egypt i have not that's the same thing it's the same thing they cannot okay. put too much money in a big pack of tide or perceived for example yes it's just too much. much yeah 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 what may also happen uh and uh I've, I've seen this also in many places is that the shopkeeper may still buy a large pack but just do the scoops themselves they sell it by the by the grams or the kilograms. Yes. Yeah. 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 They, they do that not just by for the for the detergents. They use this for sanitary packs. Yes. For uh, pampers. Yeah. <laughs> they yes. sell it by the piece. Yeah, but also for rice, for cooking oil, etc. Right. Yeah. Right. This is right. also how the shopkeeper makes makes money, right? Because uh, that's there. Uh, absolutely. Very often, absolutely. this is also linked to informal credit that the shopkeeper provides to the consumer, because consumers may also yes. be short of cash. So they get delayed payments, right? Because the shopkeeper knows the consumer, knows, well, you get your pay slip uh, end of the week, so uh, pay later, yeah. But that, that tends to happen when you have a very strong social uh, community net. Yeah. So everybody knows each other. Yeah. Then I could, I could, yes, I will wait until the end of the week to get it. Yeah. Get... yeah. Now, the thing that I can't see much, and uh, some of the photos you've shown or the clips, is that there isn't a really last mile issue. And I'm sure there is an issue, it could be an issue in Morocco, in Kenya, for example, in Kibera, one of the major squad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot get there in, with, with a truck, with a truck yeah. like that. You really have to have a small bike or a small uh, yeah, motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. Or a... yeah. Now, you don't see this as, because those, they tend to be slightly different than you, uh, a mom and pop in a, in a nice residential area, small, yes, they have a cash constraints, there is an issue of whatever, but this is not, because the way I've seen it in Egypt, the way they do it, they don't go there because I cannot get there. So the way I do this, there is always what they call a wholesaler, which is typically a store. It's really a big store, yeah, storage area. And then they sell to this guy, and then the little kiosks or little nano stores, yeah. they will drive in the morning or walk in the morning and pick what they need and then bring it back. Okay. Uh, and you would but, say also the big brands are doing this? Because in, 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 I would say, virtually all of the countries, you sort of see the top 10, 15 largest brands, they still go directly. Um, and then for the, the smaller brands, uh, they may use this wholesaler type of structure. Well, it depends. It depends interesting the, going there, right? Depends on the last mile issue. If there is yeah. a last mile issue, I'll drop it. Yes, if uh, they have to I'm go in Kibera, it. it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, I'll drop it in the, or I'll have distributors who are a basic person from the area with a little bit motorcycle with a yeah. storage box behind, and then the yeah. guy will do the distribution. Yeah, and they, they will give him a credit, whatever they do those yeah. kind of. Things. Yeah, there are so all sort of those kind, of, and it, it's slightly different when you talk about suburban areas or rural areas. Yes, uh, 
in some of the rural areas in Egypt, I've been told they do cross docking because they want to have electric truck, but they do it in a yard. They don't do it like it's not like a Walmart kind of a thing. They do it in a little yard where they get the big trucks with different assortments. And then you have little trucks that's going to go around to the little wow. uh, nano stores yeah. with the assortment that are required. Yeah. But again, when you look at the people doing this kind of things, you would never imagine that they are that sophisticated. <laughs> that yeah, well so I'm always impressed. So I've I've been on uh, well, dozens of times, probably sitting on the truck with the driver and trying to understand what's happening. I'm always amazed at what these guys do. Also, if you look at the number of stores that they're able to visit per hour, it's these are numbers that even parcel delivery companies over here would have difficulty with, right? So... Yeah. It, it it is it i i think it's a highly sophisticated operation i i, I remember in, in now talking about the the, the yard right uh, i remember at some point i think it was in colombia or so i was on the truck and uh in the distribution center they would get the full case packs uh and they, they then went around the corner they parked the truck they unloaded everything again and yeah. then started mixing the case packs organizing this by destination because they say, well, then our the remainder is much more efficient. So, yeah. It's cross docking. It's cross docking. Yes. It's yeah. really breaking yeah. bulk. Yeah. Yeah. Bre breaking bulk without yeah. keeping it in your inventory. Yeah. The, the issue of e wallet, it's uh, our, I mean, uh, e payments and stuff like that, it's catching up in Egypt. But uh, again, it tends to be more. Uh, like Vodafone kind of a support, be the Vodafone kind of an e-wallet. Yeah, yeah, like m -Pesa. Uh Yes, something yeah. like that. It's not really a, a fintech kind of a yeah. will. And, and again, it's just because of the maturity of the market. Uh, listen, I would want to leave, leave some space to others to sort of ask questions. Uh, so I'm going to open the, the floor for questions. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand. And I will uh, we'll unmute you and you, we, you can sort of show yourself and ask the question. Oh boy, we must have done a very good job in, in presentation. So there is no <laughs> question. <huh? laughs> Okay, let me, I mean, we can, we can keep the discussions going until we get someone to sort of warm up and, and ask uh, questions. You said there is a, a retail, uh, Egyptian retail chain that's going to Morocco. Yes, I'm trying to uh, remember the name. Was it Karim? Ka -ka -ka? There, there is, no, it's, uh, it's small, it's small convenience stores. And apparently they're very big in, uh, in Egypt and they are moving into Morocco. Ah, interesting. Uh, you you're not familiar with them? No, no, no. It was no. it's a convenience stores. I would describe them as convenience stores. Uh, trying to remember. There, the there's name. something called Metro. No, 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 no. Not Metro. Uh, Okay, interesting. Maxeb, Maxeb is, is actually also operating in, in, in Latin America and Africa? No, not that I know. No, I think they're only in North Africa, as far as I know. So Morocco? Yeah, they are in Morocco, but not so big. Uh, and okay. I understand over there, they're mainly targeting the uh, the restaurants more than the, than the stores. There is there is a company similar to Maxeb, similar concept called Chari. In, in Morocco, which is a Morocco-based company. Okay. Yeah. Hello? Kazion. Kazion. Ah, okay. You know okay. them? I know them, but they usually are not in... They, they tend to be in smaller townships in Egypt. Okay. Yeah, they say here it's a discount. I, I haven't... Uh, in, in, in the part of Cairo that I live in, I don't see them around. Okay, but I know that they are in in smaller cities. Yes, but those oh. those are not those are not small uh, shops. Those are reasonably mid-sized shops. They're not as big as Carrefour, 
but they're not a, not a small mom and yeah pop i haven't shop. been inside so I'll, I'll be back in casablanca next month so i'm intending to uh, to be inside and have a look yeah okay now t t tell me what is impressions about the differences i mean when you think in terms of latin america they have squatters right in some countries they have what uh, informal settlements squatters uh yes like Kibera, Kibera in Kenya? Yeah, yeah 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 like slums yes so uh, yes um so so what you see in uh in latin america is that there is a huge disparity uh, in income. Yes. You find in the cities there are very wealthy areas, very, very wealthy areas. Over there, a lot of this traditional channel, uh, they are disappearing just because the real estate cost is too high. Uh, and then on the fringes of the city, uh, you see these uh, the, essentially slums uh, developing uh, which are largely people that are migrating from the countryside into the cities and then building informal housing. Um, the, 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 the nano stores that you see in Latin America, they are in, uh, in all of the areas, except the really expensive areas, uh, down to the slums. And uh, if, if you're in the slums, uh, the, the relative density of stores is actually quite high. So yeah. there we see roughly for for every 50 people in the population there is a store mm -hmm. so to let's say middle class this may go up to every 100 or every 200 people uh, okay or um now the challenge there are many challenges by going into the slums many manufacturers they still go into the slums uh, because so Kibera, I, I, uh, I, I've not been into Kibera, but I saw it from the side. Uh, yeah. There, it's even impossible to, 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 to get in with a small vehicle, right? So you have to go motorcycle or cart or something. Yes, exactly. The density is typically a little bit less, uh, but sometimes it is against the hill, right? Like in Rio de Janeiro, there are these uh, favelas, they call the them favelas, there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, uh, essentially, the local communities, they take care of the distribution and transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm co-advising one PhD student uh, over there, and he does all of his work in these favelas. It's, it's highly interesting. It's very difficult community because, essentially, those communities are completely gang controlled. So, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. We used to do routing in Brazil. And they actually load the trucks in a way that they load the expensive materials first. They offload the expensive materials first before they getting into those those uh, yes. risky areas. Yes. Crazy. Yeah, I think that's well, one. The other one is there. that you don't want to have a lot of cash also on board when you go in there. Uh, and they may have to pay deal. production protection money also if they that's go. That's not in. a big deal nowadays because you could just pay pay by 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 phone. You can just pay by by phone. I have questions. I mean, lots of yeah. people. I'm going to ask Carl first and then Minna. Carl, please unmute yourself. And uh, I show yourself. Well, first, I'd like to thank you for your time um, and for kind of elaborating on the idea of e-payments. I think it's something towards the future. And I wanted like more of an elaboration on that because we find now that between us as students, even we use it for uh, everyday transactions such as Instapay as an app. So how do you think uh, e-payments can be a solution for supply chains? Uh, and then how do you think these solutions could apply to the Egyptian context? Yeah. Yeah, you have to fill me in on the Egyptian context, right? But uh, let, let me- uh... Morocco is very similar to Egypt. Ah, okay. Okay. So just, yes, just I mean, uh, the Moroccan case and we'll pick it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think so. If you look at the supply chain, essentially, um, you can think of uh, the, the cash itself also as physical goods that need to be transported, right? So the moment that I take that away, I take away the handling of the cash, uh, which typically leads to uh, delays. So if I'm at the shop, 
uh, when I need to uh, get a, a payment in cash done as a supplier, I mean now, as a supplier, uh, this implies I need to count the money, I need to have change, etc. So there's just time associated with that. Then I need to carry uh, the cash back on my uh, vehicle, back to the distribution center. This associates typically a risk uh, because there could be potential risk of uh, robbery. Then at the distribution center, I need to reconsolidate my cash. So again, I need to count everything because the delivery driver needs to show that uh, he brings in all of the cash which he is supposed to bring in. Yeah, that so takes time. Counting. And then there is uh, a delay until it reaches the bank account. So that's uh, basically four or five days in the order to cash cycle. So all of that just related to the physical handling relates, relates to cost that can be taken out, which directly has operational benefits. Then I think the second benefit is there you decouple uh, the moment of delivery from the moment of payment. And that allows you then to start playing with credit. So for instance, in the Kenya situation, we discussed with one supplier that was applying a 12 hour credit. So, so over there, in particularly in the poor neighborhoods in uh, Nairobi, the stores are so short of cash that their cash cycle is less than 24 hours. So essentially what they buy in the morning from the supplier, they sell during the day, and then they may have enough money in the evening to essentially pay back the supplier. So if you give a 12 hour credit, that actually allows this uh, shopkeeper to, to buy their inventory and then repay. But if you have to go back in person a second time during the day, the whole business case is gone. So electronic payment, will allow this type of, uh, of credit uh, there. So, so that's all directly in operations. I think also commercially, there are many more opportunities, right? Because it means you have lots of uh, additional data you have access to, and that can be leveraged. I showed uh, earlier in the example of the digital services uh, that uh, shopkeepers, just by offering the digital services itself, uh, they can raise additional revenue. And all of this is related to digitization of cash transactions. So, so I, I think, that, yeah, there, there are many opportunities. Essentially, think, uh, I don't know if this is part of an operations course, right? But if you think of operations and any friction in operations that's related to physical cash, a lot can be uh, can be taken out uh, by by moving to digital payments. Yes. Where, where there is, can I, I can say one more thing, where there is often a challenge in many developing countries is that um, you see that the people that are adopting the digital payments are typically middle class and up. And uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid have more difficult access to it. That, that okay. could be because it has to be linked to a bank account and people may not be banked. It could also be uh, if, if you are, if you have very little cash, and I need to essentially have both physical cash and I need to have the float in my digital wallet. Essentially, I'm spreading my cash over two sources. This essentially makes my cash handling even more complex. So, and, and I saw this in Kenya, for instance. In, in Kenya, M-Pesa has been there now for almost 20 years, but there's still quite some challenges for poor people in really dealing with this. So, for instance, they told me that the, the average number of transactions between a cash in and cash out, so they have this cash in, cash out, so, so transition between float and cash is only just over two. So that means if cash is converted to float, there are only on average, uh, I think it was 2.1 or so digital payments before it's taken out again. So, and, and that's driven by the fact that I essentially now have two currencies of which I both have very little. So for people at the bottom of the pyramid, this is not so trivial unless you really get to a situation where the far majority of the payments are all digital because then you need, don't need your physical cash anymore. And that's, I think the transition is still, still a challenge for uh, consumers at the base of the pyramid. I've, I've seen some philanthropy organizations. They ask the recipients of the grants 
to have e-wallets. Yeah. It's much easier for them to distribute. Yeah. And I think eventually those guys would actually could use this to sort of pay pay using a Vodafone kind of an e-wallet. Yeah. Kind of. It's it's very similar to m but it's, uh, it's, uh, maybe it's an earlier stage. Yeah, so it, it could be related because uh, Vodafone is a minority shareholder in Safaricom. And Safaricom yeah. owns m -Pesa. So I know Vodafone has been promoting m -Pesa or technology based on m -Pesa in other countries. Because yeah. the strength of m is you don't necessarily need a smartphone. I can also yes. do this with a block phone. Yeah. Yes, yes. Let, let me take a question from Menna. Thank Menna, you. Please unmute yourself. Thank you, Carl. First, Midnight. I want to thank you for this insightful talk because I feel like it's really applicable to the Egyptian market because because we have many like nano stories here that can benefit from the opportunities that we talked about. And so my question was, uh, what are the main challenges that these nano stores might face uh, in the process of digitizing their operations and their payments? But I know you tackled uh, it briefly. So how do you think we could solve this issue and like encourage um, more like nano stores to further capitalize on this? Yeah, it's a great question. I I I I think um, you know in in the analysis that we try to do, uh, I think in almost all of the analysis we show that this digitization also brings a huge benefit for the suppliers that supply to these stores. And and my line of reasoning there is that I feel the suppliers have a responsibility to take away the initial cost uh, of doing this, because you will still need a smartphone. This may not be there. Uh, you need data access. In some countries, I don't know the situation in Egypt, but data access is relatively expensive. Um, so with the type of research that we try to do is we're trying to say, well, there are so many benefits that fall to the supplier that I think suppliers have a responsibility to somehow take away these financial barriers of shopkeepers, but financial barriers are one. I think a second one, and uh, I don't know to what extent that's the case in Egypt, but in many countries, these shopkeepers, they are part of the informal economy. Uh, to say this more directly, they don't pay taxes. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, that uh, many of these shopkeepers, they are afraid when they start to digitize, that uh, many more of their transactions become also traceable by the government and the tax authorities. And uh, that is uh, in quite a few countries, a barrier to digitization because uh, shopkeepers see this as a threat that they may need to start to pay taxes or more taxes. Um, we've, we've done some research around this in terms of technology acceptance. And what is interesting is that these shopkeepers, they are they actually they are they are smart businessmen. If they understand that the benefits that they get from digitization are more than the, the additional taxes that then that they may need to pay, they're actually happy to join the more formal economy. And uh, with our research, what we try to show is that these benefits are really very big. Uh, and, and we hope this is a tool. Uh, we, I, I, I've held uh, presentations based on our research, also, for instance, for the Inter-American Development Bank uh, and for, for public authorities in a number of countries, where I think uh, it makes much more sense for governments that uh, that are trying in many ways to formalize these stores, to that it is much better to 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 show them the carrot of digitization than uh, to try and threaten them with penalties of non-payment. Because as I think all this, it's very difficult to enforce otherwise, right? So yeah. I th I think that these two are 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 important barriers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's, it's Jan, would you allow me to take a last question from Karim? We're going to be yeah, sure. Yeah. Karim, please go ahead and. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask about how later in the video, uh, sorry, later in the presentation, the how did how did it happen in Morocco? The the like, how did you uh, manage to change the culture 
regarding financial uh, like financial receptability uh, towards e payment like how like what what local infrastructures can financial institutions work with to change the literacy literacy of those people and how how re uh, receptive were they to this yeah we we have not done that work in morocco around digital payments actually uh, in morocco still digital payments are more or less fully absent uh, there are a number of players that are now trying to introduce but i think the most successful cases for transformation uh, to digital payments they are india and brazil and uh, the cases are interesting because what happened there is that uh, the, the central bank of initially India, but later Brazil did the same thing. They established a mandatory open standard for digital payments. And uh, any uh, wallet operator that is in the market needs to comply with this standard. And this is a very big advantage because this implies that there are multiple uh, companies that essentially are offering this service and the services have to be interoperable. Now, why is this important? Because this drives down transaction costs uh, for the consumer. One of the challenges of M-Pesa in uh, Kenya, for instance, is that M-Pesa nearly has a monopoly and as a consequence, they charge relatively high transaction costs. If you have many small payments, you don't want high transaction costs. Uh, and in, in India and in Brazil, what has happened is that uh, there are actually dozens of digital wallets. They are all interchangeable. So uh, uh, maybe to give another uh, example where it did not work is in Vietnam. Uh, there are also dozens of wallets, but they're not interoperable. So that means uh, people are walking around with three, four cell phones because <laughs> they have different wallets and they are, have to pay using different wallets in different places. Yeah, it doesn't work. In India and in Brazil, <clears throat> the central bank mandatorily imposed interoperability and then created a market for competition, which reduced the, the transaction cost close to zero. And I think if the transaction cost is close to zero, the volume increases dramatically. And when the volume increases, uh, everybody's better off. Thank you. Jan, th thanks thanks for your time. Uh, it's always, always a pleasure. And I thank you, everybody, for, for staying with us until the end. And apologies for extending beyond the 8 o'clock. That's now. okay. No worries. Uh, thank you, Dan. Okay. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you Take so much. Now. Thank you.